the universe of uh, various test preparation. And uh, I think we're definitely safe to say that we're experts in the field at this point and stage. Queller Prep prepares for many exams. Um, Hunter is just one of them, but it's really our home base. We prepare for competitive entrance exams. We've had a lot of success with the Hunter entrance exam. Uh, more students than we can count probably at this point. Mo, can we even count? No, <laughs> hundreds, thousands <laughs> at this point. So a couple of things that you need to know. I want to go through it rather quickly so that we are moving along. All right. And I'm so happy to see the admit room is moving along smoothly and flawlessly. And again, the Hunter parents are generally prompt, so I don't expect anything less than this. All right, so the first thing you should know is that Monday, May 10th, three o'clock, registration opens. Please make sure that you apply for the exam uh, as soon as possible. There's a really short window to apply for the test. So make sure that you get that done. That should be one of your big priorities. Do not wait to apply. There's no charge, the test is free. Do not hesitate with the application for the Hunter test. Uh, the other thing that you should know, they are going to look at scores. We're going to go through all these details with you, but I'm going to keep going. Okay. Uh, keep going. Uh, Hunter will accept students from all five boroughs. Pause, Mo, you're going too fast. Hunter's yeah, yeah, going yeah. to accept students. Let's stay, stay. Okay. I'll tell you when to scroll up. Hunter will accept students from all five boroughs. And these particular students, they really want to get diversity. They want to have students from, you know, different socioeconomic background, races, religions, demographics. You really want to make sure that you're applying. So please don't hesitate if you're far. Uh, quite a few families carpool. Don't worry if you live at the very end of Bronx and Queens. It doesn't matter where you are. Hunter wants you. And if you are a student who, you know, fits what they're looking for, they will take you gladly. The test is blind. They want to just see if you qualify. So keep that in mind, please. And make sure, regardless of where you are, that you make it your business to sit for this exam if you qualify. Transportation is number two. You can figure that out. Number one is sitting for this exam. All right, uh, let's keep going. We're going to, today, we're going to focus on Hunter sample exam two. They have two released exams. Uh, we're going to focus on a couple of questions from this one. Let's keep going. So at Queller Prep, we're running a very strong review course. Um, I highly recommend that families, you know, sign up for this course. It includes many exams. I want to be really clear in the schedule that you see here, there are four exams. We're actually going to give you a book and the book is called 10 Hunter Tests. So you'll have four exams and you'll have 10 more exams, which brings you to 14. And then you have an optional, let's say three or four or five, six exams. So there's a tremendous amount of practice that you'll be able to do should you, you know, sign up and join this course. Let's keep going. Mo, please. All right, this is the book that you're getting, which is the 10 practice test books. It was designed through blood, sweat and tears, really hard work, but we have it. So you'll be getting a physical copy of this if you sign up for the course. Let's keep going, Mo, please. Uh, this book is well general, core vocabulary. Vocabulary is not directly tested on the actual Hunter exam. However, it is sprinkled throughout the reading comprehension section, which is above grade level. Um, some basics that you need to know, I'm gonna go really fast. Um, a 626 or higher, a 628 or higher on the fourth grade state test. As I said in my email, this is the fairest way to just review everything. You can also look, they will look at the Stanford Achievements, Iowa, MAP, Terranova. One of the parents said they'll even look at the SCAT. So just any national testing that you've taken. Um, for the ERBs, for that exam, they look at reading and math. So please keep it in mind. I did not make any of these rules. I'm simply the messenger, okay? So please understand, I'm just relaying the information. Um, they, there's no way that they could have predicted what would have happened with a fifth grade score cancellation, so they're using four. Let's keep going. Um, I made this super visual, 626 or higher, 628 or higher. Let's keep going. You have to go to my schools to get your scores. Let's keep going. Um, and the Terra Novas, again, they're going to look for 90th national percentile, icerblearn.org, 90th percentile of reading and math. Please keep that in mind. Let's pause for a second. So the ERB, Terra Nova, Stanford, Iowa, any of these exams, MAP, this is the first year they're using MAP testing. So plus one for UNIS kids, negative 10 for basis kids, because there's no testing um, that will qualify the kids there, sadly, very sadly. But again, they did as much as they could possibly do. All right, let's keep going. Mo, please. Uh, all right, let's pause. So this is the Hunter website. We keep going. And there are, there are a lot of great articles about just Hunter being an amazing school. Let's keep going. Um, you're going to receive, stop, you're going to receive a Hunter invitation letter. You're going to receive it through snail mail. Do not wait for snail mail. You're probably going to get it a month after this test is over. So please make sure that you are not um, someone waiting for the letter. 
because everything is going to be dated improperly right now. Let's keep going. If you're a new resident, um, they're going to consider out of state scores. They just have to be appropriate reading and math scores. Let's keep going. This is the young Mo. Remember the young Mo? This is what, 10 <laughs> years ago? This is a very, very long time ago. All right. And this is actually an amateur video. And little did I know these videos would garner seven thousands. We have, I don't know, we have a lot of videos with lots of hits and I'm very grateful, but this is a great video that um, Mo took and who would have ever thought this would be a very famous video on the internet right now. Um, so Hunter will be administered throughout the college campus in a very safe setting. I am certain they're not going to leave any stone unturned with regards to safety. So I can say you will definitely be in an environment where you will absolutely be distanced. In general, the kids are seated one seat apart when they take the Hunter test. So I can only imagine the kids are going to be a mile away from each other. Um, the Hunter test format is more or less unchanged, but there is a little bit of um, commentary about there being a two-part essay. So it might be just, you know, part one feeding off part two. Mo can elaborate on that because they've had versions of essays, but basically it's a reading section, reading comp, math section, there's poetry. There's no direct vocabulary absent what's in the reading passage. Let's keep going, please. We have essay samples. Um, so Queller Prep is not affiliated with Hunter High School. We just prep for the exam. So just keep that in mind. Like that's as far as our relationship goes. We, we just offer tutoring. In general, we offer aggressive tutoring. Um, I'm an attorney. I would assume some of you know that or don't know that. But I, again, I'm an attorney. So I, I mean, the way I became an attorney was by studying tremendously. There were 40 real released LSATs when I prepared for the law school entrance exam. I took every single test two times. And I can tell you that I started studying six months ahead of schedule for the bar exam before anyone else um, in my class was really studying. I was just, I was just someone who studied. I studied a lot and I, I got pretty far on it. So, um, and the mechanics of, you know, it's not rocket science. You just have to do a tremendous amount of preparation. Let's keep going, please. Mo, please. Yeah. Some good essays. We have a great newsletter. We have really cool programs. We have a really nice blue theme. Our environment is wonderful. Um, and we operate physically out of Queller Prep in Queens right now. And then we also run Zoom. Um, we, we have a lot of different programs. If anyone is interested in other programs, keep in mind, we have everything. We have LSAT, we have MCAT, we have third grade ELA math. So everything is younger and um, older. So I want you to keep that in mind as well. If you are part of any kind of organization that's interested in doing outreach, this is a big deal for Queller Prep, especially just with so much going on. And we really do want to work to change the narrative. And especially if you are part of any any company that would want to sponsor a student, co-sponsor a student, sponsor a class, sponsor textbooks, work with any disadvantaged youth from community. Please keep in mind, this is something that's just so important. And quite frankly, it's personally important to me. I'm a child of immigrants. So please keep that in mind. All right. Um, I want to quickly go into the chat box and then we're going to begin in just a moment. Okay. So really, really fast. Let me see the chat. One moment. Okay. So um, I'm noticing two questions that have been coming up. Um, one is about what the actual date is of the exam. Yeah, I, I don't know. Actually, actually, I'm going to let me just answer them because then you'll take okay. over from this point on. OK, and I'm going to mute myself. So the test was a it was posted for a minute to say 22nd. Then it went to TBA. So the official test date, as I'm speaking to you right now, is 23rd. So that's the official test date. But again, they might do multiple shifts and you'll know that soon enough. So as I'm speaking to you right now, 23rd, but again, it was 22nd, literally a minute before it was to be determined. It was that week. So just keep in mind, it's either going to be that day or the next. Kids are physically in the sixth grade when they take the exam. So today, anyone who's a sixth grader can sit for the test. The actual students who enter the school are entering in the seventh grade and the school itself is hunter high school okay so hold on uh just one second i just want to put a setting on so you guys cannot unmute yourselves i'm sorry okay so the actual school itself is going to be uh for students who are in seventh grade so it's hunter high school but you're actually a seventh grader starting this high school and then they mo can mo will elaborate on that and then the school goes through grade seven eight nine ten eleven twelve and everyone is in that one group called high school and then it's called hunter college high school again mo will focus more on that later but it's really Hunter High School, but then it's part of the Hunter College community. It's um, kind of like a project for the gifted and talented and identifying talents. So the first thing I said was 23rd because 
we jumped the gun. So we went ahead of, you know, we were waiting for everything to post online, but again, they said 22nd, as I'm speaking to you right now, it's 23rd. I believe they're going to run it over one or two shifts. Okay. So be very careful. Keep in mind that today, two days conversation is Hunter High School said on the website 23rd. The test itself is for sixth graders. The high school is grade seven to 12. I think I covered all the questions. Am I missing anything? Oh, uh, is the 23rd a school day? So the Hunter test is always given on a school day. It's an excused absence. They usually provide a note. Um, the Department of Ed works with Hunter to allow this to be a valid day off from school. So granted, the test is on a school day. Please keep that in mind. All right. I think I answered every question in the chat. And we went through quite a lot in the past 10, 12 minutes. Thank you everyone for participating. Please consider the Queller course. We also have private one-on-one -on -one tutors available, but the course is very comprehensive. All right. Um, and with that being said, um, please ask any questions that you have and you can, um, these questions are in the chat box. Um, and I just wanna politely remind everyone to stay on topic, on focus and on task with the questions, um, not you know, uh, use this as a social moment. So please make sure that we stay on task. With that being said, when is the deadline to apply? So I didn't see that right now, but it's gonna be really soon. So you wanna make sure that you apply very, very fast. Please don't waste. Oh, thank you so much. June 16th, um, it might be sooner than that actually. There, there's very little time. So make sure that you are applying as quickly as possible because they also need time to validate your test scores and make sure that, you know, all your tests are aligned with the application. Uh, I think we're good, Mo. You can take it straight from here. I answered all the questions that were in the chat. Um, can I register for Saturday morning? And uh, uh, you can alternate. You can register for one session. All right. The time of the test, Mo, will go over with you. It usually 7.30 in the morning, and then everyone comes in and starts testing figure by 8 a.m. We can go over that with you. We'll start with page one. All right. And if you have any questions, type them in the chat box. Mo, you can take over from here. We're good. And thank you, everyone, for listening and paying attention. I hope this is a really great informative webinar. We're going to go over what to expect on the actual physical format and testing of this exam. This will be a paper exam. Keep that in mind. All right, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you for that um, introduction and all that information, Francis. Um, so my name is Mo. I'm one of the tutors here at Queller. And so I'm a Hunter College High School graduate of uh, class of 2012. So it's been quite some time since I've spent my years at Hunter with my 10 year anniversary coming up. But I know quite a bit about the exam because I've been working with students for, um, on this exam in particular for the last um, 10 plus years now. So a little bit about the exam, just to break it down, we're gonna go off of what we know and what has been on the website, as well as what we've heard from uh, people at Hunter. So to begin things off, right, is just to try to understand where this test is coming from. So in years past, and of course, with the last um, year and a half of the world being kind of turned upside down and on its head with it being a very trying time for everyone in kind of every kind of sector, including education, testing, of course, has been delayed, right? The Hunter test usually takes place in January. And this time we're finding out that, you know, in the end of June is when they'll be testing June 23rd as of right now. Now, in terms of the test, usually people who would qualify for the test, it was based off of your fifth grade statewide exams, but because that wasn't able to happen for current sixth graders last year, that's why they have the addendum to have fourth grade scores taken into account on whether you qualify or not. And Ms. Queller has gone over what scores are needed and also it's been sent in the email. And I think Hunter themselves, when you look at the application online, lets you know what scores are needed in order for you to qualify. That being said, the exam is broken down into three subsections. There's a math section, a language arts section, and an essay writing section. So the math section and the language arts section or the reading section, it is made up of 80 multiple choice questions. And so it's broken down as in 50 multiple choice for the reading comprehension section and 30 multiple choice for the math. That brings you to 80 in total and then an essay prompt. In years past, um, the reading comprehension has been, you know, filled with different, uh, various different genres from poetry to um, prose uh, and so forth. So it's a good idea to have experience practicing different types of reading styles, right? And also to get a good feel for the types of questions 
in, you want to do a lot of practice, right? So you can't just go ahead and read a lot of different types of material. You need multiple choice questions that are going to be supplemented with them. So you understand how they're going to be going through um, the passages and what kind of questions they're going to be uh, putting into place. One of the best ways to practice in general is after you read any body of work to ask yourself, did I really understand what this passage was about, what's the message the author is trying to get across, who was the main character, you know, the various details that make up a story. Um, the other thing is that Ms. Pillars touched on this a few times about vocabulary not being directly um, tested on the exam, but it is tested through the reading. So if you're reading a passage where you don't know many of the words, you're going to have a harder time understanding the passage. If you see a question where you don't know some of the answer choices, whether those answer choices are correct or not, because you're not familiar with the words, you're gonna have a hard time answering that question. So through that lieu of reading comprehension and the questions that they ask, they're able to gauge your vocabulary as well. On the math section of the test, you know, you're not allowed a calculator on the exam. And some of the topics that they go over are, you know, computing values using decimals, fractions, percentages, uh, whole numbers, there's probability, division, multiplication rules, basic operations, uh, rates and averages, ratios, time and money, area perimeters, geometry, numerical and visual patterns. This part, the numerical and visual patterns is very important because it's not something that's typically taught in a lot of the curriculum from kindergarten to fifth grade. Maybe in the early years of schooling, like kindergarten and first grade, but after that, the math curriculum, at least in New York City and New York State, is pretty rigid on what it does following the common core. So some of the topics in the math section are pretty straightforward, but the way they're asked may be uh, a way that's unfamiliar to many of the students. That's why it's very, it's a very specific way of asking math questions, and that's why it takes a very specific type of practice, right? And Hunter has been known for this for years, right? Where they take word problems and tricky possible answer choices. And so students have to be quick in their computation and comfortable as well as accurate while still being able to decipher the questions. Let's move on to the next section. So the essay section in years past has been all about demonstrating originality, effectiveness, and use of detail in your writing. And usually it ends up being some sort of narrative, right, where they give you a prompt and it's meant to, con meant to have you connect back to that prompt. So in years past, the prompt has been about, you know, write about your, your favorite place in New York City, write about your everyday superhero. Uh, write about a book in which you learned a lesson and how did you apply that lesson to your life. So as the years have gone by, the topics have become a bit more complex. Some topics have also been borrowed and taken straight from college application essays. So that's kind of what they're looking for here. Because, you know, Hunter is, once you're in Hunter, um, it's a free education from seventh grade to 12th grade. It gives you a private um, high school education or even higher um, for free once you gain acceptance. But it has no interview round. So this is their best way of trying to gauge some personality out of the student. Um, in 2016 specifically, students were asked to choose between two essay choices and neither of the options were New York City centric or New York City focused. With that in mind, one of the things that we've been hearing is that the writing portion may be separated into two parts where they build off of one another or they might give you a choice between two passages as well. With that being said, this is why the writing portion of the test is probably the hardest to prepare for in the sense that you might be a great writer and you might have all of the basic toolkits you need in terms of being organized, writing a great um, introduction, a great conclusion, but you might not have picked the right topic to write about. And so we'll go over that and you know how Quiller has a very specific system on helping you strengthen your, um, I guess, bag of tricks, right, of topics that you can choose from to write kind of any kind of response that may, uh, that you may be asked to write. So scoring and selection, this is what they used to do. With things being changed and the trajectory at which they've been changing things, they may no longer do it in such a manner. But essentially what's always been the case is about two to 3,000 students take the exam. The top about 500 uh, multiple choice scores have their essays read or the writing portion of the test read and evaluated. And once you've you know, passed that threshold of the top 500 multiple choice, then within those 500, based off those essay responses and those reading the writing responses, they see the top about 170 to 180 students and they keep around a 20 to 30 person wait list as well. Because each year has about 200 students at Hunter. Every single graduating year has about 200 students. And a few of those students also come up from the elementary school 
where they have uh, usually five, 50 students per grade. So that's kind of the breakdown of the test in itself. Does anyone have any questions? I just saw in the chat, any idea when Hunter will announce acceptance? Um, not clear, but I would have to assume it's gonna be sometime in the summer around uh, either the end of July or probably the beginning of August because they need to finalize who's coming into their school and also send over all the material to then have students come in in September for orientation. Um, so it would definitely be earlier than that, but there's no date that they've given or that we know of as of now. Are there any questions before I start diving right into the test using uh, their sample test too on their website? Will the test be digital or on paper? So the test will be taken in person, so it will be um, on paper. Any other questions before I move on? No. Okay, great. So these are just some general test taking tips that I want everyone to be aware of. Because the test will be on paper, make sure you mark up your test, right? Having a clean test doesn't get you a higher score. So make sure to write everything that you can and that you need on the margins for reading comprehension, annotate, 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 mark up the story, underline, right? Um, answer the questions on the test booklet. So for me, I circle all of my answers. And when I took the test, when I still take tests to this day, um, I circle the answers on the um, test booklet and then I transfer them over to the bubble sheet just so I make sure that I have them in both places. Never leave an answer blank. If you have a blank, if you have a answer that you guessed on and it comes out to be wrong, you don't get penalized for it, right? If you were to get an answer, if you were to get a question wrong, you would gain zero points. If you were to leave it blank, you would gain zero points. So it's not like they subtract points for guessing. Um, answer easy questions first. I stand by that, right? You don't want to skip around the test too much, but you definitely want to answer questions that you know the answers to really quickly or that are manageable so that you can gain those quick, easy points. And then questions that might take a little bit more of your time, you can actually spend more time on them. Read the questions carefully, right? So. One of the big things that Hunter is known for is being able to be kind of like tricky and they know what kind of things will trip up students. So for that reason, they're gonna have like answer choices that may seem obvious to those who've been tripped up in the beginning. That doesn't necessarily mean that if something is the first answer choice is going to be wrong, but it's just that you should proceed through the questions with caution. You wanna also always read all the answer choices, even if something seems right right away, because you wanna read through all the answer choices just to make sure that the other ones are wrong. Pace yourself, it's a long test. The entire test is given to you all at once and it's three hours long. So time management is another thing that these students have to become prepared for once they go and sit for the test. If you're not prepared to take a three hour test, you don't have the test stamina, that's not gonna bode well for you. If you burn out trying to finish the test in an hour, an hour and a half, your, your final questions are gonna suffer and usually your writing response is going to suffer at the end as well. When you take the test in person, as is every test, right? You have to create an atmosphere that promotes test taking. I remember when I went to the test, there were people around me who were chewing gum really loudly, people who were tapping on their desks, you know, with their pencils, every little bit of noise can kind of get in the way. You have to be able to block that out, right? So it's just being laser focused for three hours. So it's not just having the ability to power through an exam for three hours, but to also keep on that focus. And remember, as you're preparing, make sure to relax, right? In the sense that you don't wanna burn yourself out either. It's gonna take a lot of practice. In years past, we've had students prepare for this, through like a five, six month program, if not earlier, but no one saw the test coming until they announced it literally this weekend or rather on Monday. So with that being said, right, they studied, the students in the past have studied for six to eight months, if not longer, and they continued throughout. You all have a month. So for better or for worse, right, we're learning it now, right? The test got announced yesterday and we're having a a workshop today. So Queller is not here trying to waste anyone's time or to waste any time in trying to start preparing for the exam, right? So now it just comes down to within this month, who is going to spend more time or spend more effort, make a bigger sacrifice to prepare for this exam? That's what it's gonna really come down to. All right, any other questions? Okay, great. So now let's begin with looking at the sample test. So this is taken straight from the Hunter website. It's their exam um, sample test two. And so it starts off with reading comprehension. Here's an example of one passage, right? And this one is from, this is taken from a passage in 1845. So this is kind of like 
um, historical fiction, right? It's from the life of uh, Frederick Douglass, right? So this actually biographical, right? So this is one type of passage that they have. And then um, there's multiple choice questions. Each multiple choice question is followed up by five um, answer choices. So if you were to guess, you have a one in 20, uh, you have a one in five or 20% chance of getting it right. Uh, the passages that I have seen that students have the most amount of trouble with coming into this is something like a passage B or poetry. And the reason why they have a lot of trouble with it is because poetry is taught in school, but usually discussed, never really done with a lot of multiple choice questions to go along with it. So when students learn about poetry, they learn how to decipher the poem and go on. And so they'll use a lot of those skills here, but then they have to answer questions on a multiple choice format as well. And that's what trips them up. So this is what I wanted to take a look at and show you all how I would approach this question if, for example, I was taking the test right now. So this passage starts off with, and we'll, we'll read through it together and you'll see me annotate and how I walk through it. So first thing is experience, that's the title. And these are each known as stanzas. So in a poem, stanzas are basically your paragraph equivalent. So what I like to do is after every paragraph in reading comprehension, or in this case, after every stanza, I like to take a break from reading and try to talk to myself or annotate what have I just read so I don't forget and I'm not just blindly or mindlessly reading. This morning, I looked at the map of the day and said to myself, this is the way, this is the way I will go. Thus shall I range on the roads of achievement. The way is so clear. It shall all be a joy on the lines marked out. And then as I went, came a place that was strange. Twas a place not down on the map. And I stumbled and fell and lay in the weeds and looked on the day with Rue. So a few things to notice. They have Rue underlined here. So this is probably going to be, uh, there's going to be a question on it. So one of the things I believe helps you as a test taker is if you already prepared for the questions that are going to come up. So they're probably going to ask me what this word means or why this word was used. The second thing I noticed is there is a break in mood within the passage, within the stanza itself. The first four lines are very optimistic. They're very happy. So here, I'm just going to write happy. Now, as I annotate, remember that these annotations are for me. They're for myself, right? No one who's going to be looking at your test is going to look at your annotations and try to make sense of them. They're going to only care about what you answered in the multiple choice. So your note taking only needs to make sense to you, right? And then over here, it says, and then I went, came a place that was strange. It was a place not down on the map. So our narrator was using this map to navigate through something, came upon a place that they were not familiar with. And that threw them off, right? So this was something that they were, that was unexpected. And because it was unexpected, it threw them off, right? And that's what I'm gonna write down here. And so, and I looked on the day with Rue, I'm gonna go with Rue means something bad. So even if I did not know what that word meant, right? I can at least get the connotation of the word from what I'm reading. And then I'm gonna continue reading. I am learning a little, never to be sure, to be positive only with what is past. And to peer sometimes at the things to come as a wanderer threading the night, when the mazy stars neither point nor beckon, and of all the roads, no road is sure. So this is, again, the narrator saying that from their experience, they're learning never to be sure of anything, right? So to be always prepared of things, to change or take a turn right and to be positive only with what is past so that they can only be sure of what uh what's already happened well they have a scantron for the tester i'm just also looking at the chat questions yeah the they'll have a scantron for your test as well so i'm learning a little never to be sure to be positive only with what is past so narrator can narrator is learning to be flexible right ready for whatever is thrown their way right? And peer sometimes at the things to come. So they can try to look into the future, but never count on that, right? As a wanderer threading the night when the mazy stars neither point nor beckon. So even though they don't really have any full direction, right? So they don't have any real direction. Well, let's save the questions for the end. So if anybody wants to type questions, you can do it just where we have to end at 7.30. Um, so just please keep that in mind. All right. Um, so thank you, Mo. Let's just keep going. All right. So we'll we'll answer all the questions around 720. All right. Go ahead. Okay. 
All right. It says, I see those men with maps and talk who tell how to go and where and why. I hear with my ears the words of their mouths as they finger with ease the marks on the maps. So now our narrator is looking on at others who seem to have such a great or ease, you know, a way of navigating, right? So others able to navigate easily. And only as one looks robust, lonely, and querulous, querulous means complaining in a whining manner, right? As if he had gone to a country far, and made for himself a map. Do I cry to him? I would see your map. I would heed that map you have. And so the narrator is saying that I would only trust those people who had gone and made a map of themselves rather than following any other map that these other people who are boasting would talk about. So essentially, he's saying the narrator's lesson to us is, and this goes back to the title, right? That experience creates the best map, right? So the message of this poem seems to be that Overall, if you're trying to create a map or a layout of going someplace, the best way to do it is to go out there and have the experience for yourself, rather than to listen to others or look at someone else's map, right? So the whole point of this is to figure out what they're trying to say in the passage as well, because I know a lot of those questions are going to come from there. So now that I'm prepared and I fully am confident that I know what's happening in the passage, I'm going to move on to the questions. And for the questions, we just go through them kind of quickly with confidence and always go back to the passage to back up your answer. The key is as long as you have you have evidence from the passage itself, you your answer will not be wrong. It'll be able to be backed up. Number 10, when the speaker mentions the map of the day, he is referring to what? So he starts off early, right? And he says that this morning I looked at the map of the day and said to myself, this is the way, this is the way I will go. And thus shall I range on the roads of achievement. So the map is going to tell them the roads of achievement. So the map has all of his future plans, right? So I'm looking for something that says future plans, direction to a physical place. So you'll notice that I like to cross out wrong answers so that they don't enter my brain again and try to cloud my judgment. The hours on the clock, his religious faith, a guidebook, his plans and dreams. So I think this one is fairly obvious. His plans and dreams is the best answer out of all the choices. The best way to describe the speaker in the first four lines of the poem would be what? And we knew that this was going to happen. I said this was someone who was happy. They were looking forward to the day, right? So we're looking for a positive answer. So is it a disgruntled? Nope, that's negative. Confident seems like a good answer. Humorous, he wasn't meant to be really funny. So I'm going to get rid of that. Responsible, I mean, it's not as positive as, say, confident. Apathetic, to be apathetic means not to care for something. So that's going to be wrong. So this is a prime example of if you don't have a good vocabulary, you might get this question wrong if you don't know what apathetic means. And that's why, Ms. Queller, we're, you know, we're, at Queller, we're pushing for you to have that core vocabulary book and practice from it and up your vocabulary. Twelve, the change in, this, um, the, change in the speaker in lines five to eight is a result of what? And so I knew this question was also coming too because I've taken enough tests. So once you've taken enough practice tests, like you'll know what to look out for. Well, it's because something threw him off, right? There was a change from one to four to five to eight, right? He came upon something that was unexpected and it threw him for a loop. So the change in the speaker is a result of a minor injury, a great fear, an unfortunate encounter, overturned expectations, a dangerous location. So the best answer here is that something unexpected happened because that matches up with what I wrote down in my annotations on the side, right? Unexpected. So the best answer here is going to be D, overturned expectations. 13, as used in line eight, Ru means what? So we know that we're looking for something negative. Indifference, anticipation, terror, delight, regret. So right away, I'm going to cross out delight, anticipation, and indifference. So we should be stuck between C and E. When I'm stuck between two choices, especially when it comes down to vocabulary, I go back to the passage and I try to fill in the word and see which one makes the most amount of sense. It says, and I stumbled and fell and lay in the weeds and I looked on the day with terror. Or I stumbled and fell and lay in the weeds and I looked on the day with regret. So the person fell down, right? And it's because they came across an unexpected um, turn within their trip. So it has nothing to do with being scared. So rather than terror, regret would be the better uh, word to use based off the evidence, right? So for me, every answer choice has to be backed up by evidence. If it isn't, then it can't be the right answer. 
For number 14, when the speaker says that he learns to be positive only with what is past, he means what? So it says to go back to line 10, and I follow directions, and I'm going to go back to line 10. It says, I'm learning a little, never to be sure. So the narrator is learning to be flexible, to be positive only with what is past. So the narrator is saying that even if I have a map, I'm learning to never be sure of what's in front of me, to always be positive, the, uh, to always be willing to be flexible and change. The only thing the narrator can be positive of or sure of is what happened before. So the answer here is that you can only be sure of what happened before. So if I'm looking at number 14, the past is joyful. He can't be certain of the future. The present is confusing. Time moves too quickly, all of the above. Well, I know that it's not gonna be all of the above or the time moves too quickly or that the past is joyful. Rather than saying that the present is confusing, he's just saying that I need to be someone who's flexible and ready for anything that comes my way because I cannot be certain of the future. So B has to be the best answer here. 15, the men with maps whom the speaker refers to in lines 15 through 18 are what? So let's go back. 15 through 18, he's saying that I see these men, these men with maps and talk who tell how to go and where and why. I hear with my ears the words of their mouths as they finger with ease the marks on the map. So these are people who are sure of themselves, right? Others capable of navigating easily. They're people who have confidence. But he doesn't really trust them, right? Because he says that, and only as one looks robust, lonely, and querulous, as if he had gone to a country far away and made for himself a map, do I cry to him, I would see your map, I would heed that map you have, right? Heed is, I would probably listen to, right? Because that's probably going to be a question as well. So essentially, the last stanza is telling us that the narrator sees a lot of people around him who listens or who have a lot of maps that they can navigate through easily. But the only one he really cares about is the person who looks tired and worried and someone who's lonely and has gone through a lot and created a map on their own because they've learned from their own experience rather than following others. So the men with the maps whom the speaker refers to in lines 15 to 18 are people who are sure of themselves. So the best answer here is gonna be self-assured. When referring to the men with the map, the speaker says, I hear with my ears the words of their mouths to emphasize what? Well, it's to emphasize the fact that they're talking a lot, right? They're self-assured, but he's just listening to them, right? He's not going over to them and asking them to borrow their maps. He's more so running to the person who looks tired and who has for themselves made a map of their own. And that's what he's trying to emphasize. It's not how much the men talk or how articulate they are. It's not the volume of the speakers or the directions that they give, but it's to showcase how little value he places on what they say. Right, because he would rather learn from experience and create a map on his own or learn from someone who's done something similar. The speaker likes the man described in lines 19 to 21 because the man has what? And we've been hovering around this the entire time and the title of this poem is experience. So that man has had more meaningful experience by creating a map of their own. And that's why the speaker likes that man. As used in line 23, heed means, we said heed means to listen. So the closest answer to the one we picked would be pay attention to. Throughout the poem, the speaker learns the importance of what? Well, the speaker learns the importance of experience, right? So is that you can go through uh, a journey where the road is not familiar as long as you take your time and pave out your own path. That's the lesson in this, right? Learn from experience. So friendship and loyalty, that won't be the answer. Facing the unknown and paving one's own way. That's not bad because it hints towards experience, but I'm going to keep it. I won't cross it out. It's not so good that it you know, strikes me as something that I should immediately pick. Following directions on a map, uh, not really, right? Because this person is trying to say that you should make the map your own when you have experience. Planning carefully for one's future. Well, the narrator says that it's nearly impossible to plan for the future, so that won't be the answer. And all of the above, that cannot be right since we've crossed out so many, so it has to be B. And the last question in this passage, the progression of the poem is from what to what? Well, this is talking about how the poem pro uh, progresses. Well, the narrator starts off someone who's very, I guess, energetic, happy, and confident. And then they realize that there's much that they don't know when they get hit with something that's unexpected. And as they go along, they realize that the best way to learn or go through things that are unexpected is to gain experience. So I would say that overall, the passage is showing growth. 
right? So I'm looking for something that here mimics growth and that would be ignorance to wisdom. And that's just a sample of one of the many passages that can show up on the test and specifically for poetry, how I would handle them, All right? Um, I think at this point, we wanna go over number one, parents, students, students, any questions that you have, type it into the chat box, please. And then Mo, with our remaining time, if you can just do an overview of topic by topic, what we can expect, that would be so great, just so that we have a crystal clear picture of what to expect on this exam. And then at 7.20, yeah. let's, let's really, parents, any questions that you have, we want to, and Mo can go over some tips to close up the webinar as well. Go right ahead. You got it. So that takes care of um, the reading comprehension, right? They have poetry. We've talked over how they have historical passages. They have straight up stories like in passage C. Um, a lot of the passages that we might see here might be old timey uh, writing, right? Like I'm, when I would say old timey, I mean writing from the 1900s. And so for a lot of students, that's hard to decipher. Uh, Hunter admits even on their website that it's because of copyright purposes and they're not able to include newer pieces, but every year they get newer pieces to have on their exam. So just be prepared for that. Um, and so that takes care of the reading section of things. For the writing assignment, something that we've touched on already is that um, you need to have a good idea of the topic to write about. So for example, in this one, it says, th uh, the writing assignment says, think about the time you learned something from a book that you were able to apply to your life outside of school. So one thing to think about beforehand or coming into the exam is they like to ask about these like kind of moral dilemmas or growth, the things that you've learned as a student in sixth grade. So I would always have in the back of my head um, experiences that I've learned from one, right? So real life experiences, Another thing would be experiences from books or movies that I've seen. Another one would be, you know, people I admire, places that I've gone that have shown me things, uh, in particular moments that I've regretted or learned from. So the whole purpose of the, re of the writing passage is to get a feel for you, both as a writer and as a person. So be, be um, able to write about yourself from kind of like the outside looking in, right? Be comfortable with writing about yourself and be highly organized. That's really important. And for the writing assignment, it takes a lot of practice, not just to hone your writing skills, but to continuously be able to think on your feet. So one of the things here that I know that we've done at Queller is, for example, every student, I'll tell them to pick out one of four things. Uh, I'll make the list right now. A person that they admire or a person that they can write about, a place that they can write about, a thing, so like an object, and as well as a lesson or experience. And sometimes these overlap. And the reason why I, pick, I tell them to have these things in mind is because then they can fit this experience or this place or this person into multiple different essays. So like the common example that I don't know if you've seen this like an older video as well is I've written essays about like my grandfather's pen. And so my example with that starts off with what's an everyday object that you enjoy. So I write about my grandfather's pen, right? And I talk about how I, it got me into writing it was passed down to me by my grandfather, who used to be a journalist. Then if the essay topic were to become uh, write about a person you admire, I would just write about my grandfather and I would relate it back to the pen. Or if it wrote an essay about um, what do you want to be when you grow up, I would talk about being a journalist and you know being inspired by my grandfather's pen. So that one object or topic becomes uh, malleable, right? It becomes something that's interchangeable and I can adapt to different scenarios based off what they're trying to ask me to write about. And so that's something that we want students to be comfortable with. Have a few of those topics like the grandfather spent in their kind of like bag of tricks so that they can take it out and be ready for whatever topic um, the essay or the writing assignment requires them to write. And this takes practice to fine tune what those uh, bag of tricks or those what those topics become for each individual student. Moving on to math, you know, so with before I move on to math, the writing section does give you scrap paper. We always say it's a great idea to plan spend five to 10 minutes planning, you won't regret it because then the writing aspect of it, the two pages that they give you or the page and a half that they give you to write about, it'll make things a lot more easily. It'll make writing it a lot more easy. In terms of the mathematics section, the questions start to tend off, um, you know, they tend to start off quite easy in terms of like simplistic until about question number five or six. And then they start to move into this jumble of, some questions get harder and some questions get easier. Usually most uh, multiple choice tests and Hunter is no exception to this. Start off overall 
going from easy to hard, but that doesn't always necessarily mean that the hardest question will be the last question on the test or that the easiest question will always be the first question on the test. Uh, the topics uh, that I can best show you that um, kind of showcase what Hunter math is really about is something like a question number 54 or a 56, where they tell you to go kind of above and beyond in terms of so for example, number 56 says, when all the whole numbers between 100 and 350 are written down, how many times does the digit four appear? Now remember, you can do this by writing out all the numbers from 100 to 350, but that's gonna waste a lot of time. So it's all about building patterns and organizing the information to help you do it in a quick, efficient manner because the test is timed. And that's who is going to get the advantage on the test, right? Then they have like these nonsensical equations where they want you to just follow the, um, the examples that they gave or the directions that they gave within the problem. There's, of course, dealing with percentage problems um, as well as rate time distance problems. They also have these kind of like clues for figuring out um, what a number is based off of divisibility. They want you to be able to work with both negative and positive numbers and know how squaring a negative number is going to work. So properties between positive and negative numbers. Also things like number 62, a magic square, where there is where there's an advantage to knowing and being comfortable with algebra. They have ratio problems as in number 63. Um, so there's a vast majority of topics for math that they supplement. But these topics are things that you should have learned in sixth and seventh grade, but they're different from the way that you've learned them in school. So there's different categories of mastery, for example, right? Um, in school, oftentimes what they do is they'll ask you, they'll teach you a topic, they'll showcase a few number of questions that they can ask you about the topic and then ask those same questions again on a test but with the numbers changed around. At Hunter, they take it a step further by incorporating multiple topics in one problem and having you decipher which topic is needed. And so one of the things we do here at Queller is help students break down a problem to the level at which they're comfortable figuring out, oh, for this problem, I should use this aspect of geometry, but I should also know this fact in algebra. And that's how like the melding of different topics in math come together. Other examples is, you know, 3D geometry and like in number 68, um, finding area as a number 71, um, being comfortable with rate, time and distance as a number 74. Um, number 75 and 76, all again, have to do with geometry. So there's a vastness to the types of topics that can be asked on the Hunter test. I would say that one of the th best ways to describe Hunter test math is it's less like school mathematics and more like math contest competition uh, mathematics. So being able to practice those um, gives you a leg up for sure. Uh, does anyone have any questions on the math section in particular? Or Francis, do we have enough time for me to do at least one math question to showcase everyone how to um, navigate through it? Uh, yeah, you want to do one of the questions? It's fine because no one's asking questions. Okay, okay so go ahead. Great. Go ahead. So I'm going to just showcase you how I would do question number 56 rather than writing out all the numbers. So for me, I would organize it from since it says between 100 and 350. I know that right away, the numbers I'm looking at are 101 to 349 inclusive. That means including those n numbers. And then I would begin to organize them based off of tens. So for example, from 101 to 199, I'm going to break it down to 101 to 110, 111 to 120, 131 to one, sorry, 121 to 130, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to just show you what that breakdown does to the problem and how it makes um, writing this or counting these numbers up a lot easier. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually change it up a little and do it by units of 10. So I'll go from 101 to 109. Uh, and let me actually rewrite these. 110 to 119, 120 to 129, 130 to 139, 140 to 149, and so forth. So it's saying when all the whole numbers between 100 and 350 are written down, how many times does the digit four appear? So the digit four appears here only once at 104. Here only once at 114, only once at 124, only once here. But at 140 to 149, I have to pay attention, it appears every single time and actually twice on 144. So it appears for a total of 11 times. 
And then that pattern follows with every other section from 150 to 159, 160 to 169, 170 to 179, 180 to 189, and 190 to 199, where it occurs one, two, three, four, five more times. So if I were to count from 101 to 199, the number four appears 20 times. And I know that it's gonna follow that same pattern from 201 to 299. So it's gonna appear another 20 times. Is everyone with me? Now, I've counted from 101 to 299. So the last stretch of problems that I have to count for are from 300 to 349. And this 300 to 349 is going to mimic what I'm highlighting in blue here. It's gonna mimic this stretch. So that's gonna be one, two, three, four, plus 11, 15 more numbers. So now without writing all the numbers down, I know exactly how many times this number is going to show up, right? It's going to be 20, times from 101 to 199, 20 times from 201 to 299, and 15 times from 300 to 349. So if I add those numbers up, 20 plus 20 plus 15, I'm gonna get 55 as my answer. So it's just that organization, that methodology that they're looking for um, in order to give yourself an advantage, okay? Does anyone have any other questions for me regarding the test? So I see one here, is there a makeup for the exam? There is no makeup for the Hunter test. Will we be able to uh, have extra paper for the Hunter test? I remember when I was taking the exam, I could raise my hand and ask for scrap paper. The scrap paper will not, however, be graded. Okay, and you have to throw it out. In Quill Prep, over the next few weeks, how many essays will kids go over? I'm sure there will be an ample amount of essays to go over. And I think um, through the program that Francis had put up, in the email, it says clearly how many days are set aside just for the essay. Uh, can you go over a problem like number fifty-four? Um, I, I think we're I think we're a little bit out of time, and I don't yeah. want to create. I, I do want to give some final tips. Can you just give Mo some general advice, and um, can you kind of just speak about the opportunity that Hunter offers as a school, just so that we get a, an overall global picture of what Hunter offers? Of course. So Hunter starts in seventh grade and technically you're doing high school level uh, material starting in seventh grade. And essentially seventh grade as grade is your welcome into the school. So the nice thing is that you get kind of, you know, at all at once, you get hit with the fact that usually students who come from other schools to Hunter, they're usually the top performers at their school, head and shoulders above everyone else. And then they come into school and they realize, wait, we're kind of all the same here. So it's a very humbling moment in the beginning. The second thing is that in seventh grade, there's that adjustment period of trying to get used to like the demands of a school like Hunter, where whatever was a group project or a school project that would come once a month in your old school is something that's done on a weekly basis here. And you're juggling a lot of things at that, with that at once. In eighth grade is where your transcript starts to come into place. So the grades for seventh grade they count in terms of telling you where you'll place in eighth grade, especially for math, because Hunter math diverges in eighth grade into two sections. One is honors mathematics and the other is extended honors. So that's why your seventh grade grades matter. But in, an, in one aspect, your seventh grade grades don't go off to college, whereas your eighth grade grades do. So in eighth grade, starting from eighth grade and onwards, everything that you do is monitored and added to your transcript, which will go off when you apply to college. So the nice thing is that in other high schools, whereas you start from ninth grade, in eighth grade, you have another year to showcase your grades or showcase growth, right, from an adjustment towards colleges that in other places you aren't able to. The other benefit is that since you start off in eighth grade, uh, a lot of students finish a lot of the state requirements by 11th grade and senior year, we're taking college, college level classes at different universities. I, for example, took organic chemistry at Hunter my senior year which is usually a second year college course. And that definitely helped me when I took organic chemistry in college. A lot of my friends took classes, uh, math classes at Columbia, language classes at Hunter College so that they could grow more proficient in whatever subjects they were interested in and also showcase that to colleges when they applied. Hunter has a variety of sports teams. Um, I was part of lacrosse and basketball. It has a theater that's very famous, produced uh, in the program there, you know, produced uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, uh, who created Hamilton. So 
all in all, there's a lot of extracurricular um, that are available at Hunter as well. A few other things is, for example, Hunter Science uh, Research Seminar is available, and it's led by a, a wonderful team from the science department. And every single year, they have people who become Intel winners, if not runner-ups and finalists. So just because Hunter is known as a humanities school doesn't mean that it doesn't excel in math or science either. I think what it does is it provides you with a more balanced view of the world, right? It teaches you both the strengths and ways to pursue something in STEM while still being able to have an appreciation and pursue something in the arts and humanities as well. I think the biggest thing that Hunter has over a lot of other schools that it gets compared to in New York City, such as the specialized high school, is the school size, right? Uh, whereas schools like Cypress and Bronx Science and Brooklyn Tech have, you know, grades in nearly the thousands, right? At Hunter, every person uh, in your, you'll get to know every person in your grade for better or for worse within the six years that you spend with them, right? There's 200 kids roughly about in each grade. My graduating year had 189 students in it all together. Uh, Hunter is very challenging, right? It is, uh, I remember that there were times where I would, you know, do homework, go to school, have two meetings during lunch uh, for my clubs, Right after, I would have like 30 minutes to myself, then I would have basketball practice. I would have 30 minutes to myself and then go volunteer at the local hospital, come back home at like around 10 p.m. and start my homework, stay up until like two because I wasn't satisfied with the quality of work until I was you know, satisfied with my quality of homework. And then I would go to bed and then wake up the next morning and start it all over again and you know, continue this way for a few months. And I knew that everyone around me was doing as much as me, if not more. So I think the biggest thing that Hunter has for itself is its student body, as well as its teachers, because your teachers really push to make sure that you are being challenged and also helped at the same time when you are being challenged and you feel overwhelmed. Your students get to know you on a personal basis because it's a small knit school. And then the other thing is that everyone around you is incredibly smart in very unique ways, right? We had students uh, who you know went on to work with um, you know the state senator. We had other students who helped design things and uh, for Google while they were juniors in high school still. So there's a vast majority of, I guess, different types of intelligence always at play here. And I think what that does is growing up in that environment or learning in that environment, it never makes you complacent, right? It always pushes you to strive better and become a better version of yourself. And I think that's the biggest thing that Hunter has um, to offer that I think is really invaluable. I think we're good, everyone. Thank you so much for participating in the webinar. Um, and please, you know, check out the Queller Prep course. We're happy to run it. Uh, this is definitely the first time that we're running such a one month course. We're squeezing all the days out of it. But the Queller Prep course is really comprehensive and we hope that you consider signing up for it. Um, you can enroll. We will deliver books, materials, and supplies to you should you make the decision to sign up for the course. So you would just pay for the course. We would deliver the material to the door actually. Um, including all the hard copies uh, of the materials. Um, I wanna do a very special thank you to Mo Khan. I really enjoy having the rare opportunities to publicly thank you. There are 90 members in the chat, they get to hear it. Thank you so much. And for those of you who are aware, uh, today's actually Ramadan. And I wanna just thank you Mo Khan for running this webinar because you have been fasting and it really means a lot that you're doing this and you agreed to do this on 24 hour notice. Um, I think it would be really nice if in the chat box, if everyone just gave Mo a huge thank you because this was really a last minute request. We put this together in a day's notice. So I wanna say Mo Khan, thank you so much for this really, really quick webinar and um, all this information. Thank you so much, Francis. Uh, thank you everyone. I hope this was really helpful. I wish you all the best of luck. You have about five weeks to prepare um, and you know, take advantage of it. I, I think the biggest thing is whether or not the result at the end of the day is something that you wanted. The journey here and the experience that you gain from test taking, you know, tests never end. I, I'm 27 years old here and I know that I've taken many tests throughout my life and I know that there will be many more. So for that reason, just the experience of growth and learning how to test take and prepare for something like this is as challenging as it is, is something that's worth doing. Because with that experience, like that poem that we read, comes a lot of wisdom. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. So, Mo, that's it. We're going to sign off. Thank you to everyone who listened. I hope you got a lot out of this hour. And um, feel free to, you know, with feedback or any response. And you can email us. You can reply to the emails that we've sent. And um, Mo, once again, thank you so much for doing this. Um, and you have not eaten for 12, 13, four, how many hours? I wanted to, it really means a lot that you agreed to do this. And thank you in general. Just thank you for every single moment that you spend teaching and educating from the hearts, okay?
All right. Thank, thank you so much. Have a great so one, much. everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. Farewell. Bye-bye.